People who fight against God are all going to get it. They're going to they're, 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 they're digging their own graves. Yiskar Kol Mechasar. So Hashem says, speak of getting help from Zion, from Jerusalem. So we ask Hashem, King David asks Hashem to remember all the offerings that we brought out of our love for Hashem. There's more to say about that subject. Burnt offerings, flower offerings, burnt offerings. Yadash Nasel, they should be accepted graciously. Eaten the Hoha Vavecha, and he, Hashem, should grant you all your heart's requests. And all your good resol re resolutions, he should enable you to fulfill them. It's easy, it's, it's not easy to have even good re resolutions. It's even harder. Well, I don't know what's harder to have a good re resolution or to fulfill it. Each one has its own challenges. Well, he should give us a blessing that we should fulfill them. Now is the time for good resolutions. Just, what's the trick about many good, good resolutions? The trick is, number one, there are two tricks. One is do something easy. I don't say, I'm gonna say the whole till every single day in English. Say, I'm gonna say one chapter in, of till today. Or I'll say even one or two lines and I'll try and say them in Hebrew. Something easy. That's trick number one. Choose something easy. If there's something that's bothering you, you were never able to, to do it, and it's not a, not something hard, but you you know, like putting the cap back on the toothpaste. <sighs> Just try it one day. You know, I, I used to smoke cigarettes. When everybody smoked cigarettes, I mean, you know, we're going back now to the Middle Ages. I was the, that's when I was around in the last of the Middle Ages. And, and I smoked and I stopped. How did I stop? I never stopped. I haven't smoked in 50 years, but I never stopped. Because I knew if I stopped, I would never be able to keep it. So I never stopped. I didn't stop smoking. Just I'm, today, today I'm not smoking. Someone offered me a cigarette. I said, no, thanks. Not today. <laughs> Not just now. Maybe later. Anyway, so Hashem should enable us to, to fulfill all our good resolutions. First step is take an easy, something easy you could do. You know you could do it, right? Like, don't say, I'm going to do 100 push-ups every day. But do something easy. You know, I'll, I'm going to try and touch my toes three times today. Before I stop. Number two, start right away. Don't start tomorrow. Start now. And then you stand a good chance. Let us rejoice in your salvation. We'll be able to say it because we kept our resolution. And that in itself is a, a mini salvation. That's redemption. What is what is the redemption of the Jewish people? So we be able to do what we feel is right and good and to serve. Hashem. So if you have a resolution, you fulfill it that in a small way, that's Mashiach. And when everybody does it, in the national scale, international scale, that's the, the big Mashiach. It's the universal coming of Mashiach. And it comes for each individual person. All right. Ata Yonaiti. Chapter, verse number seven. Now I know, says David Melech. Ki Heshia Adonai Mashiach Hashem says his anointed redeemer. Yanehu, he answers him, Mishme Kotche from his holy heavens. Bigavurais Yesha Yamine, with might and salvation from his right hand. Now, might and the right hand don't go together. The right hand is the hand of kindness. You give with the right, with the left, you push away that which is undesirable. The left is the hand pushing away is, is strength. So left is the side of strength, discipline. The right hand is the hand of giving, the hand of love. So by Hashem, Hashem is great. He can do both together. So that's what it says here. The might of salvation in his right hand. Might belongs in the left hand. Hashem can make 
like might be in the right hand, the hand of kindness. Some people come with chariots, but some come with cavalry and horsemen, horses. We come with the name of God on our lips. They stumbled and fell. We stood and we're standing and we're going to continue to stand forever, forever. The Jewish people are an eternal people. Netzach Yisrael. Netzach means eternal. Did that expression ever? Netzach Yisrael. Even Hashem is called by this name. Netzach Yisrael le'yeshaker. It says, the, 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 Netzach means victory and means something eternal. Netzach Yisrael le'yeshaker. God says in, a, in the prophecy, uh, I think of Hana. <clears throat> I could be wrong. But it says, Netzach Yisrael le'yeshaker. The, the eternity of God does not say falsehood. We'll never tell a lie. Lay a shocker. God says something, it's going to be. Please, God, save us. You are our king on the day that we call to you. Tanya. Chapter 1. Okay, so we, we have this problem that Rabba, who was the greatest person of his time, <coughs> said that he was an example of a Benini. And his colleague, whose name was Abai, this is Rebbetz and Simcha there, are you snuck in quietly? Okay, good, Mark, you're here. Ashana Tova Umetuka, a good sweet year to everybody. Okay, so on page 39, Rabbi says he's a Benini, and Abaya, his colleague, says, this is terrible. If you're a Benini, we are all wicked. So what's the future? We have no future. We're all wicked. Um, and we know it's not true that you're a Benini, because... It said when your time when the when the, the, the not, not Abaya says the Talmud says that when the in Gemara of in Shabbos the Talmud about Shabbos tells the story that when the time for Rabba came that he had to leave the world so the angel of death was sent to bring him back to Hashem and he couldn't do it because his mouth never stopped saying words of Torah. And Torah is the source of our life. Couldn't take him. So he had to make a trick and make him make a, a, a paving stone in, uh, in the steps to give way. And he fell. And when he fell on the way down, he stopped saying words of Torah because he was falling. And the angel grabbed him just at that moment. So how could you say he's a Benini? Benini don't Benis don't live on such a high level. That's, uh, I'm sorry, it's in Baba Basra. For those of you, you scholars, those of you who want to look it up in the Talmud, it's on page 86 on the first side of the Talmud. About That's the Talmud all about law, torts, real estate, and partnerships, and things like that. Where one partner has a claim against the other. It's all there. It's all in the books. Jewish law, how it works. Unbelievably, unbelievably deep and profound and logical as it's the basis of, of modern business. So how could Rabbi consider that he was a Benini? And he's going to elaborate on this, page 40. Let's read through this. He says, we have three categories, righteous people, Wicked people and the Benini in the middle. So now the Alter Rebbe suggests if Rabbi said he was a Benini, perhaps we could think that maybe sometimes he was a person was wicked, 
and sometimes he the a bainani is half and half. A righteous person is is very very good. A wicked person is maybe sometimes not so good. And a bainani is half and half. Says the author, and we can't say half and half because we got Rabba there. Rabba was never half. Rabba was never sometimes wicked. Never. He was only he, the whole time he was saying learning Torah, teaching Torah. He was totally connected with God the whole time. So how could so, so forget about half and half. A Benini is not half and half. We can't understand that a Benini is half and half if Rabbah said he was a Benini. That, that's what we're going to have to build on, that, that bit of knowledge. Okay? And we know, we know here, if a person does a transgression, bottom of page 39, anyway, if a person considers that he is wicked, even part of the time, or even once, he's, he's called wicked. So forget about Rabbah being half and half. But well, but then he adds this, but if a person does tshuva, we spoke about this, right? If a person does tshuva, then he's not wicked anymore. This is an amazing thing. Everybody says, um, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I never knew I didn't lead a life according to the Torah. I wasn't brought up that way. I didn't know. It's not my fault. What am I going to do? He said, don't worry. If you do tshuva, that means you're not going to go back to any of those ways because you didn't know any better. Then, then you're bigger than a wicked person. You're bigger than you're bigger, even bigger than a tzaddik. It says about tshuva, where about tshuva stands, even the most righteous person cannot get to such a high level. We'll have to explain that later in the year, or maybe even later in a different class, another class. But that's what it says, that a person who does tshuva is higher, even higher than a person who his whole life was righteous. So if he, if he does, does tshuva, then right away, he's, he's, he's righteous. So what's the bainani? Not only that, the definition of a person who's wicked is so so carefully measured so let's say a person is constantly doing mitzvahs except he has one little mitzvah that he neglects to do what is he is, is maybe that a bainani he does all the big mitzvahs and sometimes a little mitzvah he makes a mistake so he says no there's a tal there's a, 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 a place in the talmud where the sages say that even if he only does some little tiny Avera. Uh, not, not the most significant thing in the world. He forget, forgets to make an Erev Tavshilin. Like last Wednesday, he forgot to make Erev Tavshilin. And next Wednesday, we're going to have to do it again. And then a week again, I have to do it again. And a person forgets to do it. It's not the biggest Avera. It's not a mitzvah of the Torah. It's, a, it's an injunction of the rabbis. And if he doesn't do it, He's called wicked. And again, he shouldn't be get depressed because you know, he'll make a good resolution never to make the mistake, same mistake again. And not only that, it can go even, we can go even further with it. Let's say a person never does anything wrong, not even little things wrong, but he doesn't try and help other people that they should do things right. And it gives an example in the Torah, in the Talmud, of a rabbi, a sage, one of the sages, who had a, a neighbor who didn't keep every little detail of Shabbos. He kept Shabbos, but the sages, you know you're not allowed to carry on Shabbos, right? That's one of the major labor, 39 labors of Shabbos. By the way, as an aside story, that's how I became a uh, Shabbos observant. Somebody suggested to me that I should uh, look into the idea of keeping Shabbos. I said, ha, ha, sure. And then I had this little booklet that I got from the Reformed Temple where I grew up. And the, the rabbi there wrote a book about the Sabbath. I read that book, but I didn't like it. It was, it was, it was a lot of double talk. I didn't know how to keep, keep the Sabbath. I decided I'm gonna give it a try. I was in my mid twenties, give it a try. And so they had a little kiddish there. And 
some philosophy about how now times are different, people have different idea what it means to rest and so on. I didn't like that kind of double talk. It looked like double talk. It didn't look, didn't feel real to me. In the back of the book, the rabbi made a big mistake. He listed what it says in the Talmud. What are the forbidden labors of Shabbos? You know, they're 39, 39. And they're mutually exclusive. They're not the same thing repeated in different words. Each one is completely different from the other. 39 times of work, creative labor. I said, oh, wow. You can't, I said to myself, you can't mess with this. This is too powerful. This was put together by a very powerful mind. I couldn't write such a thing. I couldn't write that. It demanded to be respected. And then I saw, whoa, wow. I'm not doing half of these things. I'm doing them all wrong. I'm not keeping Shabbos. Well, one of them, so that gave me a strong desire to try and do it better. I'm still working at it 50 years later. Never got, never got to the end. <laughs> it's it, immense, it's the whole world. But one of these 39 is carrying from one place to another, transference of pride. Why is that? I can understand making a fire, putting out a fire, chopping wood, planting, reaping, harvesting, cooking. These are all creative things that people do. Make the world go around. What is carrying? If I walk out with a key in my pocket or a credit card or even a few dollars, you know, it's not, it's not hot. It's not, I can carry sofas up and down in the house to make room for guests. And it's not, it's not, I'm not violating the Sabbath. Carrying heavy sofas around. Guests came to stay over Rosh Hashanah. We had to move the sofas out into the basement. It's heavy work, but it wasn't, wasn't violating the Sabbath, the, the young of. But if I carry a, a credit card in my pocket, that's violating young of, or a key. I met a guy once, before I was, when I was just starting to keep shops, I met a guy, he made fun of Yiddishkeit and he made fun of keeping Shabbat. And the reason that he didn't keep Shabbos, he, he knew all about it. He didn't keep it because his father used to carry a key in his pocket so he could get into the house. So if it didn't bother him that he was carrying a key, why should it bother me? What's the difference between this transgression or any other transgression? And it, it, it knocked the Yiddish, his belief in Torah out of him to see the hypocrisy and his father said, yeah, you got to keep all the Torah, except one thing I don't have to keep. Why not? It's from a different God. That's idol worship. There's a God who says you're allowed to take, take a key. There's no, no, there's no other God. Anyway, so here this rabbi, the, the rabbis in the, in the Talmud held that you're not allowed to carry, but then the question says, what about my animals? They have to keep Shabbos too. You're not allowed to work with an animal. If you milk a cow on Shabbos, how can you milk a cow? Because it's painful to the cow if you don't milk it. But you can't milk it for, for, for business purposes. I think you have to just let the milk fall on the ground. Don't quote me on that, but I think that I think I think so. You're not allowed. But you milk a cow so it won't have pain. Don't keep it in pain. So this guy had a neighbor who had cows, this rabbi. This guy had a rabbi, had, a, had, a, had cows, and they used to decorate their cows because they loved it. Listen, there was a source of livelihood and they would put decorations between the horns of the cow, ribbons or something like that. So the rabbi said, that's carrying. Your animal's not, you're not allowed to carry a credit card and your cow's not allowed to carry ribbons. And he had, a, he had a neighborhood ribbons on the horns of the cow. And this rabbi saw it and didn't say to him anything. The fact that he didn't try to help him and somehow find a way without offending him that you're not allowed to do it. He didn't even try. He considered that a transgression for not upholding the teachings of his colleagues, even though he himself 
would not have made such a transgression, but he didn't try to reach out to his neighbor to help him keep the Sabbath properly. And so he took on himself 40 fasts, 40 days he fasted to atone. 40 days, maybe had a little water at night, maybe a little piece of bread or something. So if this person is called wicked, if, if he didn't fast because he was righteous, he fasted because he felt he was wicked. He didn't uphold the teachings of his, of his fellows. So if that's considered wicked, how much more so if we have an op obvious commandment that's a clear, one of the 613 commandments, not something, a, a, a minor teaching of the rabbis about ribbons on the cows. On the, and this guy even believed in that, that a cow shouldn't have ribbons on it, on his, on his horns. So he himself kept the law properly, but he didn't help his friend to keep it the way the sages said you had to keep it. And therefore he considered that he was sinning, so he was a Russia, who was wicked. So how are we going to understand the Benini? And how much more so if that's what ha how a person behaves when he transgresses a minor, minor transgression of the rabbis about the ribbons on the hat, and he doesn't try to help to stop somebody from transgressing, um, how are we to respond to something that's an, a clear commandment of the 613 commandments of the Torah, which is the, the, the Shema. Here, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. And these words which I command you today should be upon your heart. And you should teach them diligently to your children. And you should speak about them. When? When? All the time. When you go out, when you sit at home, when you go out, this should be your conversation. Not just when you teach a class or take a class. When you get up in the morning, when you lie down at night, when you get up in the morning, these should be your words. The word, what words? The words of Torah. They should be your conversation. What do you mean? Am I no no life? Am I gonna have no life? No, you can have a life. When? Well, anytime it's not day or not night, then you could do something else. You know when that is? Anytime it's not day or not night, then you could do it, then you could. Well, there are ways, you know, because anything you're going to do, you do exercise, gymnastics. Right? I don't know how she did it. Anyway, <laughs> I watched it so many times, I couldn't figure out how she did it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could say that you do gymnastics to be in good shape so you have energy to keep your mitzvahs. So it's part of keeping mitzvahs. So we have a commandment to learn Torah all the time, but just to do nothing, just to work on your baseball scores, averages, or to play pinochle, Jinrami, Mahjong. Well, whose mother plays Mahjong? You don't even know about this. Never heard of it. it used to be a favorite game of Simcha. Did your mother play Mahjong? Yes. See? <laughs> this is a generation gap. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you. Yeah. No, it's a different. I remember five grand, two cracked. <laughs> the women would get together, play this game with the with the, 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 the things and knock the table with them. It was very funny. Uh, he's not keeping the commandment to learn the Torah every single second, day or night. That's a commandment, a biblical commandment. And if a person doesn't do it, then he's neglecting a mitzvah. And neglecting a mitzvah is like not is is like doing a, a transgression. So he's for sure a, a, a rasha, and that means that Rava never never said anything that wasn't Torah. He never said lashon hara. He never said something. He never slandered anybody. He never made even a a joke about somebody. Wow. 
So he and he's he would be if, if a person didn't keep this commandment, he would be more more considered a, a, a wicked person than someone who doesn't keep all the mitzvahs of the sages. And so that's how Rabbah could consider himself a Bainani. Or well, how are we supposed to? Do, how are we supposed to be Bainani? If that's Rabbah thought he was a Bainani, how are we going to understand what a Bainani is? And that's the challenge that the Alter Rebbe presents us on the first page of the Tanya. And as we turn to the second page, we say, "Well, when are we going to get to the end?" And we remember what it said on the front page, the very first page of the time. What did it say there? It said, the Alter Rebbe says, I'm going to teach you how to do this, but it's going to be, it's not going to be a shortcut. There are no shortcuts. It's going to be a long way. But I'll tell you a secret. The shortcut doesn't get there. And the long way does get there. And that's my 10 minute warning. And I'm going to have to go because they put bar barricades up. So I can't illegally cross the road anymore to get to my class across the road. I have to walk to the corner, get my tefillin, walk back and come to the, the minion the where I dub and across the road. So I'm gonna, usually I'll sort of stretch it another minute or two after that, after the alarm goes, but today I'm gonna have to go. So we'll continue tomorrow to solve this conundrum how are we supposed to deal with the idea that there's a book for, for us, we're average people, and Rabbi thought he was a pretty average person too, how do we fit in the same category as what he thought about himself? Any questions? Write them down. Talk it over, review together. What did we talk about today? See if you can write down all the stories that I told you so you won't forget them. Write down. How many stories did we tell today? I don't know. Quite a few. We learned about carrying on Shabbos. We learned that there are 39 labors of Shabbos. We learned you can keep Shabbos for 50 years and still not perfect the system. We learned you're supposed to learn Torah day and night. We learned about Rabbah, that he was like the Rebbe. And he considered himself a Bainini. And if he's a Bainini, then everybody else is wicked. And if, we're, if, if he's wicked, then the world can't, if everybody is wicked, the world cannot continue. The world can only continues in the merit of the righteous. We learned a lot of things. We didn't cover much. <laughs> okay, who's going to be here tomorrow? Yay. That motivates me. I'll... I'll... Get up early in order to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, they say that the food on Shabbos tastes only tastes as good as the guests. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the same thing applies to a Torah class. If you enjoyed the class, it's because of you. I have to thank you, all of you. The sages said, I learned a lot from my teachers, but I learned more from my colleagues. And most of all, I learned from my students. students. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.